Hello, Mage fans. This is Mage the Podcast, the podcast where we work hard towards ascension so you don't have to. I'm your host, Adam Simpson. I'm joined today by Terry Robinson, and we're going to be talking about the syndicate. But before we get into it, Terry, do you have any announcements to keep to tell us about? I have a bunch of announcements. First, I thought you were going to say to celebrate the syndicate that we're working hard towards ascension so you don't have to, and we will sell it to you for five easy payments of twenty nine ninety five, including shipping and handling. Um, I was going to mention that, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One, Clockwork Jim in our Discord server, discord.me slash mates the podcast, has produced a picture of a pair of ether goggles owned by Clockwork Jim. Well, I thought that was a prank. They're real? Apparently it's real. I just They're real. Ass- yeah, I okay, just assumed I that my original thought was that uh, Ian A. Watson and Richard Thomas had knocked off a Radio Shack at some point and just like cobbled together a bunch of them and just kind of spread the rumor. I am no closer to owning a pair of them. But yeah, so that actually exists. Thank you, Clockwork Jim, for sharing that. Um, thank you also to Shazus for pumping our server for uh, using the little, uh, the magical coins that you get in Discord to uh, to help hype it, which improves the number of icons we can use. I've been adding those randomly. There's now a little bicycle from the prisoner from our NWO episode that you can add into chat by doing like yeah. colon prison colon or something like that. Anyway, in addition to that, I attended Virtual Horror Con, which was a online convention that was held a number of weeks ago. And a bunch of people in my games recognized Mates the podcast, and that made me feel pleased as punch. Thank you to the folks at Occultist Anonymous for running Mage the Awakening for me. It was super fun to finally get to try Mage's sister system, for lack of a better term, our new world of darkness analog. And that was super fun. And we look forward to talking uh, about some crossover ideas later. I also got to try Delta Green, which finally answers the question of Call of Cthulhu in that you're a librarian going up against something whose mere gaze can cause a tank to explode. So why are you doing that a second time? I get the first, but the second was always confusing when people are like, we've been playing Call of Cthulhu for two years. So you're like, uh, your character's continually going insane. Maybe maybe they would settle down with a nice lady in the countryside. Just putting that one out there. Um, <laughs> I never really answered that question, but Delta Green does because it's your darn job. And I also got to try Trinity Aeon on a charity live stream that was being run by our co-host, Josh Heath. And I got to play a teleporter, and I never had to roll for Paradox, and that was very novel to me. <laughs> oh, that was a fun game. Yeah, I, I played that uh, some years back. That is a fun game. And and the last thing I have to note is Mage Noir, which was originally going to be happening the first weekend in June, has been rescheduled for July 18th. I don't know if I'm still going to be able to attend, but if I do and you're going there, please, by all means, say hello to me. I will be wearing the Mage the Podcast t-shirt, which implicitly promises that I'm then going to make myself a Mage the Podcast t-shirt. I have some ideas, but yeah, hopefully that, that happens and I can make it. And those are my notes. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Jerry. I think that wraps it up for announcements. Let's get into today's Tomes of Magic episode. We are talking about Technocracy Syndicate. This is the final uh, convention book for the Technocracy, and uh, we are roughly halfway through second edition at this point. There's a number 20 on the spine. This clock's in at 72 pages, came out in 1997. It was written uh, mostly by Mark Senzik, but uh, there's also material contributed by uh, Brocato, who was uh, publishing under the name Phil Brocato uh, back then. He's uh, Satiros Brocato today. This episode is actually a little bit uh, tricky for me to do because the uh, syndicate is one of those groups that is, I guess I'd say, the the guys you love to hate. Uh, I've talked to so many Mage fans over the years, online and offline, and uh, uh, just about everybody I talk to uh, sees how the syndicate fits so well as a a really dastardly villain and and loves to to work with them that way. And uh, I, I guess I'm a little bit of an odd man out in the sense that I can see how they work as a villain, and I think they're great there, but I can also really see how they would work as a more noble, a good sort of group. And a lot of people, I'm looking forward to getting into this book. Uh, I think we should start with a well-reasoned and not at all snarky walkthrough of this book. Terry, can you help me out there? I I <laughs> wax and I wane on how snarky my walkthroughs are. So the, the opening marked prelude, private and confidential, which would be great if it were just one. It's private, but if it gets out there, that's kind of okay. <laughs> or something like that. It's confidential, but you can tell everyone, is a member of the Arcanum has received a 
a sheaf of documents outlining an organization called the syndicate, which another character refers to as the syndicate, both times capitalized. And it is from secret agent, John courage. And they're like, Oh man, this is a massive conspiracy. Get all of our money out of these things. And that's really the frame setup. The most interesting part to me was at the end of that, when they show $20 bills and I'm like, Oh yeah, that's what a 20 used to look like. How about them apples? And then it moves quickly into, I I like the prelude because it had John courage in it. And this was back when he was, this was back before his character was really revealed. This, uh, at this point in the, the, uh, publishing lineup of mage john courage is still an unpredictable wild man who does wild things for wild reasons i thought he was just a member of the nwo who was also possibly a marauder werewolf with one dot in esperanto are you telling me you're just gonna spill it now (laughs) come on wait a few episodes (laughs) so the book is then broken up as many of the technocracy books are into two parts and the first one is labeled annual report and it starts out with a simple outline of what the group wants to do. And you could say that to the syndicate, money is a uniting paradigm, and they have a couple of somewhat contradictory roles. One of the things they say is money is a uniting paradigm. Kind of true. Almost everyone around the world uses it. And the syndicate wants to see people that they get what they are worth for whatever definition of worth they choose. They also say that they are providing a safety net to everyone. And when they say safety net, I don't know if they mean materially or in terms of providing a unified, somewhat safe reality in which to operate. And that to them is very expensive. So they feel comfortable siphoning off some of the world's financial resources so that they can fund the technocracy to do all the important things they're doing, like shooting werewolves and suppressing weird cults or what have you. And towards these two goals, they kind of have two main operations. One is to maintain what they call the bottom line. And that's what they refer to as reality or the principle of money, which I think is a interesting idea, but oddly defined. And their operations extend into, one, the traditional world of business and finance, and two, is the underworld. And the book kind of moves these two tracks forward slowly over time. And then they talk about, hey, we have access to magic. Why don't we just make money out of thin air, or why don't we use our magic to just force stocks to rise? And they say, well, stocks and money are undergirded by things that people think are real. And if they find out that the money is losing track with the underlying objects of value, then they incur paradox in the form of a market correction. So they work much more subtly to genuinely advance companies and corporations and maybe influence how consumers buy or what the public thinks is interesting as a way of directing how money is going to flow. Which brings up kind of a recurring theme in the book of saying, do these people actually do magic? And it goes back and forth between procedures or as they call it adjustments that are so subtle it doesn't really register as magic and then juxtaposed with their ability to like rent a rocket car to get somewhere and it ends with an odd version of mass ascension so all the other conventions that we've encountered so far has a notion of what mass ascension is going to look like. So the progenitors want to see biological perfection. The void engineers want to see humanity going out to the stars and leaving no stone unturned. Iteration X wants to see a merger of person and machine. The new world order wants perfect flow over understanding through controlling information. And the syndicate wants a cashless society, which to me in no way is actually a unifying paradigm. It's a goal, But I wouldn't call that mass ascension. And to me, that also directly interferes with their goal of controlling underground illicit operations. And they say, call us elitist if you will, but we understand the truth. Ascension is not the common man's game and never will be, which is kind of against the entire notion of what the technocracy is purportedly doing. This may be a case where they said the quiet part loud, where the iterators don't actually believe that everyone is going to merge with a machine, just the ruling class or something like that. But... It, it is a little bit dissonant to how the rest of them are presented. 
Uh, yeah, well, I, I felt much the same way. Uh, I was reading through this, and, and they have this argument that their goal is a cashless society. And it's like, no, that seems like a minor stepping stone towards some interesting goal. But saying that your ultimate goal is cashless society, it's like we're, we're talking about an international super secret powerful conspiracy and they want something petty like that it's like it's aiming way too low it, uh, they talk in the chapter about um a lot about how money is the ultimate measuring tool and i think it, it just seemed like too much of an emphasis it's like uh, the market and and you know commerce around the world it's it's more than just money i mean there's other measuring tools that are of interest to the technocracy as the whole and the syndicate specifically so they make this argument uh, there there's the one syndicate character talking to the other syndicate character the finance guy talking to the enforcer guy and he's saying you know what you're doing as an enforcer is very important because we need to make the sleepers afraid because if the sleepers are afraid they'll want a cashless society. And so that is the whole point of all of the crime stuff, the, the intimidation, the the bad things we do in the shadows all over the world. It is for this one thing of making them afraid. And why do we make them afraid? So we can have a cashless society. And the other thing, it felt like Adam says that it's a small goal. Like that to me is like saying the progenitor's ultimate goal is to create a low salt bacon. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah that, that, that kind of thing, basically. It, it's like you finally break into the headquarters of the syndicate and you read their files. And it's like, what? They want to do yeah. this? Oh, good grief. Let's go home. Yeah. <laughs> And and once we get that initial mission introduction, we get a list of vocabulary words, as all the convention books give us. And some of them are actually pretty neat. And even if you don't get the rest of the book, it does a good job of pointing out some of the interesting things the syndicate does. And I'll just highlight two. One, brain draining. The practice of luring or co-oping valuable or susceptible individuals away from the conventions or traditions and into the syndicate fold. This is the first convention that is willing to flat out bribe you. And I think that's a new tactic that's kind of interesting. Another one is the idea of dry cleaning, of handling a problem without resorting to violence, which says that, yeah, they do have the enforcer's arm, which Adam will go over, but that they do place an emphasis on things being done cleanly and quickly. And that is kind of what separates maybe a acceptable syndicate member from something more exceptional. And after we go through the vocabulary section, we get the history of the syndicate. And thank goodness, this is seemingly the only group in Mage that does not claim to go back to ancient times. Like, ah, oh, the first time a shaman hit a stone against another stone and said, that'll be $12. That's when the syndicate was born. Now, uh, they, they trace their, their start to the Roman Empire and to say that there was a group of people that got together because they wanted to make sure that the ability to build great things was preserved. This was called the Brotherhood of the Rule. And they thought the ability to create something novel was sacred. And this is another one of those little dissonant strings that doesn't quite fit in with the rest of the book, like maybe it was introduced in an earlier or late draft and it wasn't quite carried to completion. But one of the recurring themes is that there is something sacred to the ability to apply understanding to the natural world to create something useful for other people. And that is there, it's just never really developed. And the idea is that when Rome fell, this group scattered and they maintained their understanding of the world and kind of held it in reserve until society could rebuild to the point where the Brotherhood of the Rule could reemerge and helped rebuild a new Rome or a new great society. Uh, the problem was that in the Middle Ages, superstitionists ruled. The wizards said, if you could feed me, I'll protect you. And the old Roman associations absorbed their understanding into the churches of the day, which is why churches were so ornate, or at least that's the syndicate justification. And in 997, a meeting was called to see what they were going to do about the problems of the Middle Ages. And they said the system had to change and the craft masons were organized. We get a few other little historical bits along the way, like we find out that Robin Hood was actually an enforcer and protected markets from thieves, took a small portion and passed the rest. That Robin Hood didn't actually redistribute goods, but allowed for trade and commerce, which made everyone wealthy, which I thought was a genius, slightly slanted retelling of the myth or legend of Robin Hood. The, the next key event that happens is in 1189, the Council of Ruin bans guilds as being a cover for witchcraft. And 
finally, in kind of vengeance for this, in 1210, the craft masons attacked Mistridge. Mistridge being this tradition-controlled stronghold and being a foundation of the Inquisition, or at least supporting it, and that the syndicate was kind of very important in the shadow proxy fight that was occurring during the Middle Ages between the forces of superstition and the forces of technology. The problem was, to the syndicate, that the craft masons versus the high guild, the name for the, for the syndicate at the time, the craft masons made an error that they thought that people would work for the community, but they didn't. They wanted to secure what they wanted. They wanted to get access to the resources that they needed to get the style of life that they wanted. And then they would immediately stop working and no longer continue to improve the world around them. They called a meeting in 1325 to try and work this out, which we know as the founding of the Order of Reason. And the grand financiers said, the only way we can get people to keep working is if we get them to keep wanting. So a key paradigm consideration for the high financiers and later the syndicate is the idea of consumerism. If you want people to continue to work, if technology keeps getting better and more productive, we have to continually increase what people want. Uh, a split developed between the craft masons and the rest of the order. Uh, the craft masons ultimately backed the diggers who believed in communal land ownership. And in uh, 1649, a war started between them and the rest of the order. It ended in 1670. And Throughout the 19th century, the convention started getting cocky and almost superstitionist that the technocracy had spread at that time. The order of reason had spread so far around the world that they started adding almost superstitionist beliefs to their practices. And this is the, the growth of spiritualism throughout the, the 19th century. The order of reason was reorganized under Queen Victoria in 1885, and it became the technocratic union in 1900. The idea that the syndicate would invest in the criminal underworld, they posit as a hedge against market crashes. Now that the global economy is so thoroughly integrated and moves are, and good shortages in one area are affecting another, they needed a second line of world control. So they start putting money into organized crime or the criminal underworlds throughout the world. Then we get one of the moments in the book where they're like, Yes, we're evil, and we're going to remind you how evil they are. So they talk about how the syndicate was responsible for the victory of the Allies in World War II because they withdrew all the money from the Axis powers, and that much of that money is still in Swiss vaults. So just kind of a reminder, like, yes, we do have banks full of Nazi gold. Why do you ask? What makes you think we're the bad guys? And that kind of draws the history to a close. There isn't much commentary on the contemporary role of the syndicate in terms of how how credit cards were developed or how bank transactions had changed over time, but it does kind of piece together a unified history. What, what did you think about the, the history section? I thought most of it was was pretty interesting. Um, it's kind of nitpicky, but on page 23, uh, after saying that they are uh, the syndicate throughout history has been against socialism, then they'd say that when Hitler was getting started, they backed Hitler. And that was, you know, you can't expect every major author to be really good with, with history. It's like, oh, yeah, we hate socialism. That's why we backed Back the, the uh, National, <laughs> National Socialist Workers Party. It's like, oh, okay. But yeah, I, I had that sort of funny feeling when I was finished with it. Like like you said, there were a lot of things that you're you're kind of expecting to hear about and you end up not hearing about it. And so a bit disappointing, but I'm, I'm not going to disparage it. So the opening of chapter two is an interesting one in that there is a letter that opens between John Courage and Sam Adams, which suggests that John Courage has a contact inside the syndicate that's kind of revealing what the real goings on are. And chapter two explains the methodologies and the ranks and membership of the convention. The names are kind of dull. It's hard to keep track of them sometimes. If we step on ourselves, I apologize in advance. The lowest rung of the convention, the unawakened, are referred to as the staples, providers, or simply our friends. Uh, these are the unawakened people, and the way that they recruit, or one of the key ways, is they find people who are smart and heavily indebted, and they get them jobs inside of the syndicate. So uh, one of the best ways to make sure that mortal activities and the traditions don't get out in front of them is to make sure that you already have the best and brightest. What I found kind of funny was in the section where they give an example of someone where it's like, wow, someone with $15,000 in student loan debt. This is a ripe candidate for the picking. And I'm like, Oh, buddy. But yeah, I'm like, wow, $15,000 since college loans. You can have that little. 
<laughs> That's amazing. Above that, you have what are referred to as the headhunters or the middlemen. These are people who are responsible for finding those providers. In one place, it refers to those as being awakened. And in another case, it refers to those as not necessarily being awakened. But it is suggested that those are people who are at least go-betweens. And they are the ones who look for people who are smart and at risk. The other thing they use is obviously they're going to do recruiting through large firms and large financial operations. They talk about how some of their best recruiting is done by finding orphans and simply offering them money and stable jobs. Because at the end of the day, some people want ascension, other people want a two-car garage. They also talk about how there is this assumption that the syndicate is sexist and that it's actually not. And then there's a little note from the person providing the information that's like, the syndicate is super sexist, BT dubs. And you're like, "Uh uh-huh. Then we get to our enlightened ranks. These are referred to as grand financiers, which is a much more impressive title than you would expect for someone at this level. You have the associates. These are the magic men. And that is the actual term that they use. They are considered to have both sleeper financial acumen and a certain degree of enlightenment that allows them to make basic adjustments to skip a lot of the more mundane aspects of operating a firm or seeing that something is successful. Above those, you have managers, also referred to as wizards. They will generally have about five associates working for them, a large number of providers, and a portfolio of companies. These could be all firms in a particular geographic area. These could be firms in a particular field. This could be a collection of illegal trades that they are engaged in. They then report to chairman or the vision men, which are going to oversee a symposia in a major financial center like New York or Toronto or Tokyo or something like that. They have five to 20 enlightened staffers that are working for them. One might sit at the head of a mafia council. Another one may be stationed in Horizon. Another one may be on the board of several large major companies. And then finally above them, you have the board. These are broken down into seven divisions worldwide. One for North America, East and West, one for South America, Europe, East and West, the Middle East, and the Orient slash Australia. The next part of the section is the methodologies. Adam, you want to take it away? I can talk about the methodologies. The factions inside of conventions and the technocracy are always given the term methodology. And in the syndicate, we have five methodologies. First off, we have disbursements. They handle funding within the technocracy. They exert influence over other conventions uh, because of this funding. We have the financiers. They make profit for the technocracy, high finance types. They also have some involvement in crime. We have media control. They control advertising, movie, and television to manipulate public opinion. There is some what of an overlap between what media control does and what one of the methodologies of the New World Order does. Uh, Number four, we've got the enforcers, also called the hollow men. These are the organized crime thugs, but they are also uh, police officers, security guards, detectives, and also agents who specialize in industrial espionage. Uh, We're told that this is the largest methodology of the five for the syndicate. And last, we have Special Projects Division. This is the newest and most secretive group. They develop their own technology. They're connected to Pentex of Werewolf the Apocalypse fame. This gives you ideas for uh, werewolf crossovers and uh, also gives a door to Nefandi corruption that uh, is is sometimes alluded to in in different mage books. Uh, Along with the Void Engineers book, we see this method of of giving more mundane, ordinary sounding names, which if you were to look at um, in the setting, it's reasonable and it makes sense that a group like the technocracy would choose methodology names like this. But on the other hand, as a game that, that, that we play and like to talk about, these more mundane names are a little less interesting and they actually make it harder to remember. So like the Void Engineers, uh, you start thinking of, oh yeah, that methodology that has to do with high finance, what were they called again? You look it up, oh, financiers. I found it interesting reading through. Uh, Part of the fact that the syndicate really talks about money all the time is the fact that at some level the game is a satire. Uh, There are people that I think everyone knows that are absolutely obsessed with money and status. And by creating a group that is just that, it provides a mirror that a storyteller can hold up to allow for that to be mocked or to be considered in-game. But sometimes that goes a little over the top. So it's going to be up to each table to figure out where that comes in. And one of the cases was I was reading the enforcers, referred to as the hollow men because of the phrase to hollow someone out. They talked about 10,000 kilos of cocaine being found. And I'm like, that's absolutely ridiculous. There's never been 10,000 kilos of 
cocaine seized or anything like that. And then I remember that literally last year in Philadelphia, 15,000 kilos were seized in a port. And I'm like, huh, maybe this... Maybe this isn't an exaggeration. It was also interesting that they mentioned that, for instance, the financiers generally are making the most money. They are the wealthiest with control over mind and entropy, and that disbursements oversee the money to other conventions, which struck me as being probably the most overtly political of the groups. And I thought that was that was kind of interesting. As Adam mentioned, you have media control, which instead of necessarily trying to, to sculpt a news narrative about a particular idea, uh, they are more trying to influence consumer demands. But they also mention that periodically they will use that power to combine with other groups to see a fad. And one of the examples they give was the 1990s interest in the occult. They will pump up interest in that. They will make money off of the sales of it. And then when other unsavory bits have latched onto it, they will then use media control to quash interest in it. So as a way to kind of railroad their opposition in the Nefandi or in one of the traditions that may be trying to ride a pop culture wave. So it has this interesting mix of of roles. Yeah, the, we get the introduction of Special Projects Division, the obviously worm-tainted group that is behind any number of systems and any number of companies that are selling worm-tainted or entropy-tainted products. The next thing we get to is how they view the rest of the technocracy. And this kind of surprised me. Like, in my head, I had what I thought were their relationships with everyone else and then what it turned out to be. And their relationships with the progenitors and Iteration X are pretty straightforward, where it's like, we give them money. They give us stuff. And then for the void engineers, they refer to them specifically as being, we don't know where any of the money goes and they're not even grateful about it. And I'm like, that's interesting. Cause I thought that would fall into the same category of this is expensive, uh, but they protect us and give us cool toys. And they make mention of the fact that they don't share any of their stuff and no one knows what the money is going towards. And I'm like, I thought there would be more clarity between the void engineers and the syndicate there. And then finally in my head, there was always a long running war between the new world order and the syndicate. One representing the idea that information needs to be centrally cleared and controlled for best control of reality. And the syndicate view that Control over the marketplace of ideas is a better way of doing it by having healthy markets and being able to chase out bad ideas um, just by surfacing information, everything will go better. And they specifically mention here that the two groups tend to get along reasonably well, that the New World Order provides them information and in exchange they get prime consideration from disbursements. The media does special favors to the special project division. Uh, they're a little bit off in that they believe that information is is power where the syndicate believes that specialized information is power but that was something i didn't really expect so those were slightly different relationships among the conventions compared to what i thought it was going to be yeah i also like you i expected to hear more about a rivalry between new world order and syndicate and it just wasn't here yeah. And then they go through the reality deviant section where they talk about their take on how they divide up the traditions. They refer to the primals, which is the ecstatics, the cultists and the dream speakers, along with the verbena as being the, the group that is pulsing with what they refer to as blood dreams, natural images, totems and sexual energy. And I don't know about you, but I have never been more interested in those four traditions than when the syndicate described them as such. Just putting that out there. They talk about how they try and counter them with media control and that if anything becomes big enough, they try and destroy it by commercializing it, which I think is absolutely genius. They talk about then the mystic groups, the Christians, Jews, Hindus, and satanic sorcerers and martial artists. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'm just following along, following along. And then they're like, and then the satanic sorcerers. I'm like, so I assume they're referring to there the uh, Akashics, the Celestial Chorus, and the euthanatoi. And they talk about, again, what they do to try and subvert the mystics. They try and subvert the ideas that these troops are trying to bring into pop culture and, again, commercialize away what they do. Finally, they talk about the Sons of Ether and the virtual adepts and refer to them as neo-superstitionists and calls them as materialistic as they are careless. And they say, generally, we just buy them off by saying, yeah, you continue to do what you're doing just for us and we'll give you formal funding and better equipment and a nicer chair. The section rounds off with a discussion of paranormal beings like vampires, werewolves, ghost spirits, and fairies. They they talk about 
vampires as posing a serious threat to the bottom line and that every uh, city is ruled by a prince and that your goal is to make common cause with them by taking out a shared enemy of the two of you, which I thought was kind of an interesting presentation, and then to try and arrange a mutual beneficial partnership. I don't remember any cases where there's technocracy, vampire-like allegiances in the rest of the game. So again, this seemed like one of those cases where it's like, ah, this, this doesn't quite fit with everything else. Uh, they talk about werewolves and how important it is to shoot them. And then they finally talk about how ghost spirits and fairies don't exist. Generally, for this uh, for this chapter, um, earlier in the book, they, they talk more about the, uh, the syndicate is and, and how they work and their organization and so on. And, and so I, I thought it was interesting because traditionally the syndicate had been portrayed as being this sort of this shadowy power behind the market that sort of profits from its general operations. But this book, uh, this chapter, uh, describes them as just another company in with the companies, uh, you know, trying to profit just, just like standard companies. And so that was, was kind of uh, different for me. Yeah, other than that, I'm ready for chapter three. This chapter is headed the dirty side of the sharp dollar. And I don't know about you, but I have no idea what that means. So chapter three goes into more details on how their magic is done. And they start out by talking about how very conservative their magic is. As I said before, they don't even use the term procedures. They just use the term adjustments. And they talk about a standard list of apparatuses that they use. And these are your standard technocratic apparatuses. They talk about how also many of their effects involve getting a other people involved. And these abilities go back and forth in terms of their degree to which they are superstitionist or or overtly magical and other things that don't quite seem to be magical at all. Like for instance, uh, stacking the deck, the standard entropy two effect of your ability to shift probability. And they talk about how a lucky coin could help someone hit a werewolf between the eyes. And you're like, that doesn't seem very technocratic. And then later on, it talks about how you could use a, a stacking the deck by just doing a card draw or drawing a bullseye on something. And then later, it talks about using effects like pin drop, which allows you to uh, summon special information about someone by, by looking at their bank account and information like that and drawing in information. And you're like, that doesn't seem magical at all. And then there's another effect where it's like, we remove your ability to not feel pain. We remove your ability to black out and just have you repeatedly experience a single torture over and over again until someone just cracks and you're like, that's pretty nuts. And it doesn't, <laughs> and the focus for that seems to be torturing someone, which again, doesn't seem terribly magical. And, and to me, that is kind of the crux of the difficulty with 2E Syndicate that there isn't a very well-explained idea of hyper-economics, which we eventually get in Revised, which allows us to have some more magic and such. Um, but the rest of the section then goes on to provide devices. And these are a lot of fun. These are standard James Bond style things. You have the Mjolnir Mark IV, which is just this absolutely massive gun, which they describe as Mjolnir thunders like a mad god. It rains heavy grain shells that can rip through solid concrete and inflict horrid damage on the living or unliving. I don't know about you, but your paradigm doesn't need to make sense if you give me a gun like that. <laughs> we get one of my favorite items in Mage, the power suit that allows you to dress for success. It makes you more convincing. It is also bulletproof. More impressive to me, it is drier safe. It doesn't have to be dry cleaned. That to me is the true magic of this section. I don't know how much I would give for a suit that I could just throw in the washing machine. And then it goes through some larger items like armored cars, uh, universal access systems, and so on. The last thing that we get in here are perks. These are backgrounds that go above five. It explains what allies six through 10 look like. Normally with allies, for each dot of ally, you get an additional ally or fewer more potent people. So for one to five, that usually means you have one to five allies. But for six to 10, instead, you have six to 10. So really, I'm not sure why they wasted space explaining that in this section. Uh, we also get higher levels of influence which gets kind of messy because Influence 5 in the core rulebook is suggested as having worldwide influence, and Influence 5 here is suggested, it, it, 10 is inf suggested as being worldwide influence. They talk about Library 10 as being access to several huge archives, but apparently Dewizatep is only like a 5 or something like that. So it provides it, but again, it's a little bit, it's a little bit on the chunky side. Finally, we get some more information 
on what the actual roles do and as in what a provider is like, what a manager is like, what an associate is like, and some of the statistics before about that. And then finally, we get to some more information on what pen tax is. So what do you think about chapter three, Adam? What was interesting to me when I was reading this was I have become so accustomed to associating the syndicate with the prime sphere from uh, books I've been reading in, in later editions, revised in Mage 20. And here the book says that they are all about uh, entropy and mind. And of course, it's the chance part of entropy, not the decay part of entropy. But um, there's a note uh, in this chapter about their subtlety, how subtle they should be, how they should be kind of hiding behind things and harder to get a hold of. And and, uh, really, this brings them a lot closer to the original conception of the technocracy from the very beginning of of Mage in, in 1993. And also chapter three makes it very clear that the syndicate is very evil. I'm not going to complain about it. most mage fans are, are you know I- enjoy seeing that material, but for me it was, it was kind of like a throwback to the progenitor convention book. It's like yes, they're a convention that's not going to see, and we're going to go out of our way to make sure you know that they are just so evil. It's like yeah, 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 <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Why are you surprised we have Nazi connections? Doesn't everyone have connections to the Nazis? And you're like, ah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that about uh, wraps up chapter three for me. Chapter four, we get our example construct. And this case is Diefenbacher's Casino, which is located in Vancouver, which again is kind of intended to be a a werewolf or vampire tie-in with Dark Alliance Vancouver. I always find it funny that they're like, what's a dark city where evil powers could get along? Canada. (laughs) And (laughs) so this is a large casino that is almost ahead of its time. Like it's pretty common nowadays for a casino to mix gaming with entertainment, with sports betting, with tourism and hospitality, and to have maybe a resort section, then a family section and a movie theater and so on. But in the mid nineties, that was a relatively new idea. And Uh, kudos to White Wolf for picking up on that that trend. It walks through the group and I enjoyed the characters presented here who they refer to as the pit bosses a bit more than I think most of the other ones as in most compared to the constructs we get in other books. We get John Eaton Simcoe who is this 19th century merchant who starts out with the Hudson Bay Company and builds this empire forward. You have Mackenzie Brolin, who kind of does the same thing and kind of backs the mob efforts out of this, this six foot two, 33 year old person. And it's kind of nuts because I remember reading this and I'm like six foot two and 33. That's insane. And now as I am six foot one and 36, I'm like, I remember when I was his age and also not a billionaire. They generally have some depth to them. Uh, Tori Whittingham is this somewhat compromised person who is bane infested, meaning that there is a evil spirit literally living inside of her that, that grants a fair number of powers as well as a certain number of flaws. And then we get the cleaning crew, which is a group of people probably worm tainted. That is the Pentax crew that is, has the job of keeping werewolves out of the area. And it makes specific mention to freak legion for werewolf, the apocalypse for more information about the Fomori and the black spiral dancers. We get, information about the history we get the layout we get another little map which i love and it's cute because it's shaped like a it's shaped like a maple leaf they talk about what's what's done on each floor as well as how they get quintessence and one of my favorite things that the technocracy does throughout first and second edition is give you different ways of getting quintessence and the way they describe it is every time someone feeds a $20 bill into any one of Dyfe's many counting machines to get special tokens or chips they essentially surrender a small part of their wealth their primal life force to the realm of chance through the sheer laws of probability Diefenbachers reaps a vast reserve of prime force the ebb and flow is excited in the complex and creates a huge node a node the construct has all to itself and I like that the idea that literally people putting their faith in money handing you that money and then losing it is a way of getting quintessence from people. And then we get a standard uh, set of recommendations. Some of them are kind of over the top. Some of them are kind of interesting. And uh, yeah, the book just kind of winds down with a Noam Chomsky quote, as you kind of anticipate. That's the end of chapter four. Uh, I like the fact that this construct had no horizon realm. I always saw that as as fitting for the syndicate. Uh, The syndicate and the New World Order are the two groups that they really want to be successful on Earth with the sleepers. And if they can't make it there, then it doesn't matter what they can do in Horizon Realms. And so uh, it, it made sense to me that there there is no Horizon Realm there. In emphasizing the strong connection to vampires and worm-tainted beings, 
It helps it tie in with crossovers with uh, Vampire and Werewolf, which, which is fun. It uh, helps it make the syndicate look more evil, which is something this book was trying to accomplish. But at the same time, if a storyteller isn't careful, you risk making the syndicate look incompetent. And what I mean by this is players and, and all these other factions of the world of darkness can tell, hey, there, there's worm taint here. These, these people are not OK. The cleanup crew, there's something really wrong with those guys. But the syndicate mages are like, what? I don't see it. It smells like roses. What are you talking about? So yeah, you, you, you got to be careful. You, you want the cynic, You may want the syndicate to look evil, but you don't want them to look incompetent. To me, it's one of those things where if you are going to introduce that and you don't want it, you sh you do need to talk about the internal stresses they have. Where on one hand, they want to make money off of these worm tainted products, but on the other hand, they also recognize that they are almost literally making a deal with the devil to get money in exchange for things that may wind up polluting the consensus long term. Which is why I think partially in revised special projects division just kind of disappears and one of the revised plot threads is where did they go and what happened and yeah i i, I agree especially for the group that has command over entropy um yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah there is that there's yeah. certainly that uh two other points okay the syndicate has sort of an understanding with the the prince the vampire prince of the city of vancouver and so vampires come into the casino and they spend money and okay i guess that's good for business but you know vampires tend to be vampires and attack victims, and those victims don't make it out, uh, so to speak. And so I, I just thought it was odd that the syndicate allows this to happen. If I'm running a business and someone's killing my customers, I'm against that. I don't like that. That's, <laughs> That's a general rule. Like, No, no. They want to make this a more useful uh, tool for a storyteller by having all of the different methodologies of the syndicate operating out of one location. They want to make it more versatile for your stories. However, I, I guess that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But what I do have a problem with is, for me, it stretches plausibility. Uh, for example, the high finance types, they're going to want to have locations. They're going to want to do their thing close to the centers of high finance, which I guess in, in Canada would be more Toronto or at least downtown Vancouver. I mean, the, it's going to be very inconvenient for them to to get their information and carry out the business that they, they need to transact. And also the enforcer types, it talks about how they're they're smuggling goods in and out. And it's just, it, it increases the risk for all of the other methodologies when the cops come sniffing around trying to stop what the enforcers are doing and they stumble into, you know, everything else that's going on there. And so, but for me, it just stretches plausibility. I would have the enforcers doing their crime stuff pretty far away from the high finance guys doing their high finance stuff. Yeah, it's one of those cases where the book, as we talk about overall criticisms or overall thoughts, where it did have that tinge of first edition in that you had these periodic elements where they were needlessly evil. Also, to maintain the kind of veil of ignorance, it does suggest a technocracy that is omnipresent that has been able to get the cops to be in their pocket and has a complete ability to prevent the media from investigating the people that keep disappearing periodically showing up on the shores of Vancouver being completely exsanguinated and then having no one ask any questions. At the same time, it doesn't have the kind of world-spanning conspiracy that I think the syndicate actually lends themselves to. Yeah, uh, it, it makes sense that the syndicate would try and, instead of being a key player in the market, would try and be the market and just get 1% of every transaction, as opposed to being the person that is on the buy side or the sell side of something like that. I don't feel that it was a very good capstone. I kind of feel like the uh, convention books hit a peak with New World Order in having yeah. a good paradigm, a bunch of mm -hmm. good effects, interesting gadgets, and a good overview. And this kind of left me wanting. Maybe at the time it, it would have been uh, more satisfying, but I don't really feel like they stick the landing on explaining what the syndicate paradigm is. And I think you really need to run to have that, especially if you're going to make them anything besides evil money men. Yeah, with a New World Order convention book, you finish it and you're like you're like excited as a storyteller. You're excited to use them as a player. You're excited to play one. And then after finishing the Syndicate book, it's like okay, there's some stuff I could use here, but man, I'm not excited. This is a solid B minus C plus for me if I were to give it a letter grade. It's it's a bunch of useful stuff. It explains what the Syndicate does. I guess I would have also liked systems for explaining how syndicate control of an area influences things like what does it look like when the syndicate puts all of their efforts behind defunding a organization that the players are backing i, I would really like systems on on how to do that and how to reflect that in game like uh, resources for me as a idea i think is super important like i almost feel as if 
under the right circumstances, the two statistics in the game that are kind of the hardest to represent are appearance and resources. Like, what does it mean to have five dots? How does that actually get employed? Like, we don't have a lot of very good money systems in Mage. It's so the actual role of money in the game to me is a little bit messy, and I would have wanted this book to explain that a little bit more. Yeah, I can understand how the game writers might have been thinking, oh, well, this is not so exciting. I mean, people like uh, car chases and gunfights and magic battles more than they like high finance, you know, roles uh, again and again. But on the other hand, you know, look, the, we a few episodes back, we uh, talked about the Order of Hermes. And the Order of Hermes uh, uses their magic and their influence to have financial concerns. And they profit off that money and they, they need that. And uh, the syndicate is going to want to take that away from them. And so it, wouldn't it be interesting if you have a player who, you know, at least some kind of die rolls or something like every session at the start of a session, the player makes a role and the storyteller makes a role. It's like, OK, this is how the uh, syndicate is leaning on uh, this house of Hermes or, or, or something like that. It would be nice. It would add yeah. something to the game. And, and it wouldn't take a lot of page count to just slap something down for us. So, yeah, yeah. I, I back up what you say. And But it's a little bit out of scope for Mage. It would have been a, a novel system, and I could have seen players balk at the fact that, like, ah, we now, what is this, a stock market simulator? And then there are players like me who want a system for everything. I don't want to necessarily have to use them all. I just kind of want them to exist if I decide uh, to lean on on it. Uh, my other kind of overall criticism is just that the book, the pieces didn't quite fit together. We get this yeah. thing from John Courage. We don't necessarily know what John's trying to do. We get the SPD stuff that is senselessly evil. You have the tension between the illicit and the above board transactions. And we get no hint that there's like internal messiness. Like it, it, to me, it seems like it would be natural that the two sides of this coin would, would fight on occasion that like, hey, your illicit drug business is interfering with my chain of convenience stores or something like that. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah, the global conspiracy isn't quite elucidated and the, the global paradigm isn't really explained. Uh, but it fills in a hole in the roster. I, I, yeah, I don't, it, it's, I, yeah, it's like a, a scope problem. I see it as scope. It's like they have too hmm. narrow a scope. It's like, these are bad guys doing bad things. Like, yeah, but let's let's back it up. Let's get a bigger scope and give me some of that. I mean, this, uh, uh, this and the New World Order, these are the two conventions of the technocracy that are all about the global conspiracy mm -hmm. and the secrets and the shadows. And it's like, that, that's kind of their thing, you know, so let's get into it. There were a, a number of things I guess I was thinking about, but couldn't pin to a specific chapter as we were walking through the book. Um, one is uh, I wanted to just have a chance to give my view of the, the natural rivalry between New World Order and the Syndicate. We've got uh, the New World Order who has a very centralized, top-down, uh, kind of old-world authoritarian point of view. And uh, that works for me. It's, it's interesting, exciting, because this is very, you know, traditional thinking for a lot of cultures of the world. Then you have the syndicate. And the syndicate, it, it makes sense that they would have a very different view of things. They were very heavily influenced by their formation or their time of greater activity in the Renaissance, where they were... Uh, kind of experiencing and, and developing uh, finance and commerce and trade as they were really getting started in a big way uh, in, in a global context. Because, you know, in the Renaissance, you had these merchants in Europe who were taking trips to very far away to get stuff, and they would bring it back and sell it. And so this was the beginnings of global commerce. And coming from this background, it is natural that the syndicate would have uh, this outlook that, look, the real world is messy. There are too many variables for anybody to know them all. And the information, the situation is changing too rapidly for anyone to keep up on it. it. It's foolish to say I've got all the facts because no one can know all the facts. And even if you could, they're changing too fast. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is only natural that the syndicate would not favor um, one central authority controlling everyone and leading everyone to perfection. They think that would naturally lead to disaster regardless of your intentions. Uh, and, and so that is why it's natural that they would – uh, come into conflict with the New World Order. They're, they're probably always going to be arguing about what is the best way to lead humanity, what is the best way to conduct the business of the technocracy, and, and that you know tension can lead to a lot of interest in games. Yuval Noam Harari, in his book Sapiens and Homo Deus, talks about 
that the argument behind democracies and more unified systems in a lot of cases comes down to one of information processing. Are better decisions made when you have a centralized clearinghouse of information or are better decisions made when you aggregate a whole bunch of individual systems and and collect that information to come to a decision? And he argues that uh, the failure of communism is kind of an indication that, hey, centralized processing doesn't work as the best way to deal in a market of nations, but also comments that there may be a future technologically where we do have the computational power for that to come back and be centralized again. And I would be kind of curious to see if there is a future version of the syndicate who believes, no, we now have uh, quantum frames that are potent enough that we can simulate the entirety of the market and then try and influence things uh, kind of directly that way is also interesting because the syndicate and the new world order also both have problems with modernity. The syndicate does not work well if there are single sleepers that have vast control over mortal society that they don't have the ability to influence. I feel like the syndicate would be a Opposed kind of to oligarch billionaires who are seemingly wielding entire industries. They, they don't have a good way of controlling them. They don't have a good way of, of influencing the market at that point. So I, I would kind of be curious to see what their 21st century update for both of those conventions winds up looking like it. And I hope we get an answer when technology reloaded is actually out into the world. Uh, another thing that this book is constantly talking about uh, how vitally important uh, money is to the syndicate and how they're always talking about it and focusing on it. And uh, really, I, I've always seen that as uh, more of a sleeper concern. I mean, I, I guess I would say that this book is very, very second edition in that second edition uh, it takes this notion that mages are random. You know, Awakening is random. It's just a roll of the dice. It could happen to anyone. Whereas first edition was uh, mages who had you know high intelligence and very flexible thought and very strong will would awaken. And, and if they didn't have that quality, they wouldn't. And so mage society takes a, a very different bent in, in the early first edition. Uh, the syndicate of that time would be more distant from sleeper concerns. They wouldn't worry about uh, wealth or, or luxury or status symbols. They would say, oh, you know, that's, the sleepers care about that. We're, we, we live in the shadows, so why would we ever even think about things like that? Uh, also, uh, I, I was noticing that a cashless society enables governments to swipe people's money easily. This makes it easy for the syndicate to oppress people, but it also enables the New World Order's beloved governments to control people in tyrannical ways and interfere with commerce. And so, yeah, the, the whole cashless society, it's like you can see on one hand how they would like it and how on another hand they wouldn't. And uh, even back in the 90s and before, there were banking secrecy laws. And there was no mention of banking secrecy anywhere in this. And it, and it seemed like it should have been mentioned in this book because that has a real effect on a cashless society. If you have a cashless society, but your wealth is in a, you know, a Caribbean bank where the government, U.S. government can't touch it, that's very different from it being in a U.S. bank where the U.S. government can just swipe it and it's gone tomorrow. It, it seems like a, a vital element to this whole discussion that wasn't even mentioned in the book. So that, yes. that threw me for a loop. I kept looking, I, like after I finished the book, I was going through it a second time. It's like, are you sure there's no mention of banking secrecy here? Yeah, the only one we get are the mention of the, the Swiss vaults that contain Nazi gold. Uh, we don't really get an idea of there being uh, secret storehouses of value that are still kind of uh, quasi-legitimate. And the whole government swiping money thing always kind of threw me off because like whenever we have cases where the government says this is how you're going to have to do your transactions, uh, society very quickly come up with another way of doing transactions. Yeah. Um, anytime like a money is forced to a, a particular exchange rate, unless there are mandatory sales laws, people quickly resort to using some other proxy for value of being like, oh, okay, well, I have to take this many bolivars for a loaf of bread. I'm not accepting loaves of bread. I will only accept um, some other debt note as payment. People generally find a way around that they're remarkably good at it and and the book also does a thing that kind of bothers me that talks about like well before we had money we had to barter no uh, when we look back at history uh, there was never really a strong barter phase barter only really exists in cases where you're interacting with another group where you don't have a way of validating that they're going to act in good faith and that you're likely never going to meet again even after my favorite example is even after the roman empire fell people were still using roman currencies just as a way of keeping 
writing a ledger. So Adam walks into my bar, it's 300 years later, and we're in the, the Gallic Republic or something like that. I would still say he owes me two drachmas, even though neither of us have ever seen a drachma. I just write it down on a, a piece of slate or write it down on a, a piece of paper that says he owes me this. And then later he does some service for me and we say, hey, this is this is worth the same thing. We're good. So rather than it being a direct barter, it's intermediated by this debt instrument in the form of Adam having an IOU for me or vice versa. <laughs> yeah. Well, also about uh, cashless society. Uh, one thing about the technocracy as a whole is they have a very strong love of efficiency. They see it as a virtue. A cashless society increases efficiency by moving money faster and making financial information available faster. And this would really matter to the technocracy, but I didn't see it mentioned in the book. Uh, another thing, this book doesn't really tell me how syndicate members learn spheres or even really use primal energy, which is, you know, quintessence uh, from, from the game. I get it that they want the syndicate to be really subtle. And yeah, I agree, the syndicate should be really subtle. But, you know, if you make things too subtle, then it's like, are we even talking about mages anymore? Yeah. It's like... <laughs> if Three Dots of Life allows you to heal and the method of healing is you go to a hospital, wh- how do you get to Four Dots of Life? Like, what, is that, what does that mean? But, but again, we hadn't quite gotten to the point where a technocrat would be a player character and we wouldn't necessarily have to explain it. That's one of those holes that I kind of wish had been had been patched up. One thing that was a little off for me was the book tends to portray these syndicate mages as, as kind of like parasites, but parasites take what they want from a system and if it dies, they move on. But I saw the syndicate as as having a kind of love of this global commerce or even claiming that it was their own, you know, favored creation, uh, even using it as a tool to uplift society. But I didn't see any of that. Here the syndicate is just like, I always saw the syndicate as being this shadowy thing behind global commerce. But instead of being the people who set up the shark tank and decide which way the sharks swim, you know, shark tanks are always like a, a big circle. You don't want corners or sharks are actually going to physically damage, you know, injure themselves. They set up the shark tank. They put the sharks in it. They decide which way the sharks swim and they do a little maintenance and feeding every once in a while to, to make sure everything's going. And, and I, I saw the syndicate as being the guys who run the shark tank. But this book tells us that the syndicate is the biggest shark in the shark tank. And that's a real difference for me. I feel like the previous books maybe spoiled us. This book seems like it would have flown fine maybe earlier in first edition, but the writing in general had gotten tighter. And here that hasn't really happened. And it'll take a little bit before that corrective is put through. The writing is fine. The images I like. I thought the art was pretty well on point. The vocabulary section is super useful. I think it gives you a bunch of interesting terms that you can drop into dialogue and overhear someone being like, yeah, we want to hollow them out, but without resorting to dry cleaning. And the players are like, oh man, what does that mean? And I think it is, it is flavorful and evocative. it's, it's a perfectly fine book. It's part of a two-parter with uh, the Void Engineers book. I think the overall thing is worth $10 to get. I guess uh, before we uh, get into uh, some of our items at the end of the episode, I wanted to take a look at um, uh, my view of, of uh, a more, I guess, noble or more idealistic uh, syndicate. I can see a syndicate, even, even if they aren't actually good, I can see a syndicate that is like trying to make themselves look good. I can see them saying things like, with the commerce that we've promoted for centuries, we civilized the world. There's less war now. That's thanks to us. And then, of course, it would be, fun to uh, hear someone ask the syndicates, well, what about Africa and the Middle East? I mean, you kind of dropped the ball there. there. There's still a lot of conflict and, and war going on there. If, if, if you civilized the world, how come you screwed up a large part of the world? And see the syndicate try to explain their way out of that one. One thing about the syndicate that I never was on board with, uh, even from the very beginning, I remember when I was younger and I read the, the first edition core book in 1993 and it talked about the syndicate. It said, these are the guys who run the financial markets. They're all about how high finance, but they're also into organized crime. They're the mafia guys too. And I always saw that as like like two sides, you know, pulling away from each other. And and, and it seems like these two groups within the syndicate would be constantly irritating each other in a very strong way. It's like, how can this group even hold together? I, I have trouble seeing this. But you know, what really helped me out was I saw... The uh, few years back, the the first uh, John Wick movie, uh, the John Wick uh, trilogy of action movies with Keanu Reeves, this 
trilogy of movies portrayed uh, a main character who's a hitman and he's really good at his job. He's so good at it that he becomes famous and then he retires and um, something happens and you know, you know the villains of the movie pull him back into the world of the hitmen and then he has to pick up where he left off. And there's this shadowy organization in the assassin trade and uh, they regulate, sort of control the international business of hits, you know, hiring hitmen, hiring assassins to kill other people. Uh, they run a big hotel in every large city around the world, and this hotel is a place where hitmen can come, and they have the assurance that no one is going to try to kill them there. It's like, this is a place where killing does not happen. It is a place where they can transact their business, they can rely on certain services being offered to them, and this international shadowy organization does not compete with the hitmen, it organizes them. And it has its uh, influence on all of the major organized crime groups. As you watch these trilogy of movies, you see the Russian mafia, the Italian mafia, and all these other, you know, different uh, cultures, organized crime groups. They all know about this shadowy organization, and they all fear it, and they all respect it because they know it has incredible influence. And this, for me, as a storyteller, is a potent model for the syndicate, because here you can have a syndicate that runs this sort of shadowy organization behind organized crime groups, whether it's smuggling or hitmen or drug dealing or, or whatever. Uh, they set up the places where the criminals can come together, transact their business, they know they're safe, there's certain standards that are enforced, and in the process, this shadowy part of the syndicate, they learn about everything that is going on. They know who the movers and shakers are in the crime world, in smuggling, uh, assassination, and so on. And so when the syndicate decides that the crime is getting too violent or there's too much of a certain crime in a city, they know that it's reached that point. They know who the key players are and they can move in and they can wipe out one or two groups. And then they can say to the rest of them, well, they crossed the line. They broke our rules. Make sure you don't do that. And so th this is a way where they can profit off of the crime. They know what is going on in the crime, but they aren't encouraging more of it. In fact, they can pull back on it at times. You bring up a good point in that mages are generally liminal characters. They are on the fringe. They have the ability to interact with other splats. And of the groups of the technocracy that were likely to work with some of the other night folk, the syndicate struck me as the obvious example that you would have the void engineers who are trying to kill them. You have the NWO who's trying to suppress them. And then you would have the syndicate who's trying to profit off of them to be like, Oh, so you're telling me this fairy has complete and utter mind control capabilities and uh, is also able to go out in daylight without dying. Let's come up with a way of working together. Oh, you're telling me this guy has the ability to punch through a steel wall and all I have to do is give him a few bags of typo negative blood. I think we can come to an agreement. Uh, whereas as presented, they are just these grummy money folk and they don't really bring the world together in what I think could be an interesting way. They don't serve as integument or connective tissue in a way that I think they could. Yeah. Well, uh, moving on to a more idealistic way to portray the syndicate. With the syndicate, the concept that is so strongly tied to them is capitalism. And capitalism, I've, I've been you know doing a little research and, and some real thinking uh, this past few weeks. And uh, yeah, capitalism has always been a, a really, um, I guess you could say, emotionally charged term. I, I've talked to a number of people who think that it is all that is, is good and right with the world and, and makes the society and individuals better and more wholesome. And I've also talked to a lot of people that think that ca capitalism is this really negative influence on society. It makes groups and individuals uh, worse people and makes them do bad things. And it's an economic system. It's not. It doesn't inherently have moral or ethical qualities to it. It's. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just a, a system of doing things. Now, a lot of uh, uh, academic types uh, have written about how um, capitalism can be a good way of increasing the overall wealth in a in a large region or or in a nation, as long as certain you know things are are kept in place and and certain rules are are kept in mind. I don't necessarily see the syndicate as being so bad because they're involved with making advertisements on television or running companies or dealing in, in the Nikkei or the Wall Street stock markets. That, that doesn't make them inherently evil to me. And so I don't have a hard time seeing them as being more idealistic types.
so the the problem that we run into is when we use, when we invoke the term capitalism, we can refer to it strictly as an economic system, or we can use a I guess you could say a common parlance system. Like when people say communism in the 20th century, generally they're not talking about a communist economic system; they're talking about totalitarian authoritarianism, and that is wildly different than the economic theory of communism. So that's why you refer to uh, uh, Trotskyism or Leninism or something like that as an, as an alternative or Stalinism or what have you. And also why we were kind of, uh, while the Nazis referred to them as, as socialist, maybe that wasn't the, the most accurate word. The area, though, where we can kind of say, hey, is this the best thing, is not necessarily regarding capitalism per se, but one, uh, market control. Capitalism starts to break down when you no longer have uh, fair markets, when you no longer have the ability to transfer goods fairly, as it were. So when someone starts stepping in and, and changing the rules of the marketplace itself, then that can get that can get super messy. Um, and that's essentially what a black market is. Another thing that gets kind of messy is their advocacy of consumerism. The idea that value and goodness in society is dictated by your ability to produce and consume. That can certainly get super messy. And that, I think you can have a more valid moral argument concerning. And in this book, they explicitly say that one of the problems is when people get what they want, they start producing things. Whereas the whereas the craft masons thought people would continue to produce goods for the good of the community, like uh, churches or community gardens or great cathedrals to learning and understanding, the syndicate said, ah, eh, if people don't have a reason to produce more, they're going to get lazy. And the idea is that consumerism compels them to produce and produce and produce and consume and consume and consume, and that they are, are driven to increase their economic output so they have the ability to acquire more things. That, I think, is a better target of criticism in that, yeah, uh, th that, that kind of naked consumerism is pretty boring, and I have a hard time defending it. I, I am perfectly fine saying, well, if someone wants to get more and more stuff, that's, I guess, okay, as long as they're paying for the externalities of the harm that activity causes, and as long as they're doing useful work in an effort to forward it. And, and to me, in a lot of cases where I hear criticisms necessarily of capitalism, it is more or less a criticism of one of these other philosophies or ideas that tends to go along with it. And for me in the syndicate, the most obvious one there is to attack consumerism. And I think in terms of talking about the color of money, Wall Street, and the movies of the era that they make reference to, that monomaniacal desire for cash as an indication of status, status wealth, and importance is something that we can validly criticize and does have yeah. a good place in a mage game. So yeah, it's one certainly. of those things where it's 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 almost one of those cases where once everyone agrees on the terms that we're going to use, the argument disappears where you're kind of like, yes, yeah. bad things are bad. Carrying on. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I just thought it was, I talked to mage fans. Yeah. It's like, oh, the syndicate, that's about capitalism. And some, some people are like, oh, capitalism is such a nice thing. And other people are like, capitalism is such an awful thing. It's like, it, it's kind of a neutral thing. It's, yeah. it's talking economics. It's not talking moral good or bad. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so more idealistic group of uh, syndicate uh, members would uh, probably have a soft spot in their heart for Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, which uh, changed the paradigm, you might say, for economic thinking for the Western world. Uh, they would probably like to quote uh, the old adage, "Rising a rising tide floats all boats. Uh, this would be a technology who wants to see everyone prosper. They uh, are not in the market competing with other people in the market, but they have a way of uh, putting certain fees in place very quietly where they, they take a percentage off of the success of the overall market. And so they want to see uh, international commerce and, and markets do well, generally speaking, for every country of the world. Uh, they would say organized crime is a necessary evil, but one that they can keep within certain bounds rather than trying to increase it to increase fear. They would see international commerce as a means of peace and innovation. When people want to engage in commerce, that means they don't want to get together armed forces and bomb the neighbor next door. They, they see a profit in trading with them. And so this sort of idealistic uh, syndicate would say, hey, we're, uh, when we pursue commerce, we are decreasing war. And isn't that a good thing? Can't we agree that uh, when people stop shooting each other and trying to trade with each other, that's probably a good thing? So yeah, yeah. that's my idea for more idealistic uh, directions to take syndicate, if that appeals to you. And if it doesn't, I certainly understand. We all think differently. 
Yeah, I think there, there's a certain valid interest. Uh, Montesquieu referred to the idea of gentle commerce or soft commerce, that the act of trade civilizes people. Because one, you're thinking, what would another person want? And what can I produce that that other person would want? Which kind of mm-hmm. forces you to step in their shoes. And the other idea is, the person I kill today, I cannot sell anything to tomorrow. And I think the, the best example that combines the two is, no two countries that both have McDonald's have ever declared war on one another. So, <laughs> so a rather crass commercial example. But <laughs> it, it works. It works. You're, you look at it. You're like, that may come crashing down Then this podcast episode may not age well. But for now, I'm comfortable with that statement. Adam, do you have any adventure ideas? I've got three on my mind. First off, playing the syndicate. The virtual the, the virtual adepts have started a campaign to destabilize North American governments and economies. The New World Order is furious, but ineffective. The syndicate players are called in to support the New World Order with data. The players discover the adepts are relying on a new cryptocurrency to raise funds and pay flunkies. The adepts are expecting a code-breaking conflict they're prepared to win. The players instead trace the points where cryptocurrency becomes normal currency and learn what the adepts are doing and where. The players can now make surgical strikes against the adepts and soften them up until their charismatic new leader can be found. The players have to play a double game to keep the impatient New World Order in the dark so they don't flip the table before the game is done. Number two, opposing the syndicate. The players take in a young runaway with amnesia and records of transactions of an important export of an import export company that went out of business years ago. Right away, the Russian mafia sends thugs after the players, but if the players can interrogate them, they learn nothing. As the heat from the mafia increases, the players reach out and learn the Euthanatos are the only council mages with underworld connections. Can the players trust the death mages to help them get to the bottom of the syndicate's plan? What was that old company importing into the city? And why do the runaway's fingerprints match a man who died five years ago in a gambling raid? Number three, also opposing the syndicate. The digital web is buzzing with news that the impossible has happened. Blockchain technology has been compromised. Sleepers don't know it yet. The players intercept technocrat messages that say the syndicate is in an uproar after their leader of Asia and his lieutenants have vanished. As the markets sour and high-tech stocks plummet, rumors circulate that the syndicate is realizing its ultimate goal of the instant market. The only clues for the players to follow are the corrupted blockchain servers and whispers of a new cartel offering secure financial transactions to the world's elite. Whether technocrats or council mages, the players travel to the historic cities of Eastern Europe to investigate the source of the new cartel's agents and tech. Can they get to the bottom of things before the global turmoil topples sleeper nations? The syndicate will play a double game, claiming to track down their own rogues while interfering with the players. So those are three ideas. Hopefully they can uh, stimulate a few ideas out there for our listeners. And I believe that brings us to the conclusion of another episode of Tomes of Magic. Was there anything to contribute before we finish, Terry? One how dare you insinuate that I ever contribute to on page 40. My favorite quote is armor your butt, John. It's a crazy world out there. And I just wanted to pass that to the audience. <laughs> well, if you have something to say, please contact us at mage, the at gmail.com with your questions, comments, or feedback. We always love to hear those. Uh, subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and other places. If you like the show, others might like it too. And if you leave a review of Mage the Podcast, it makes us more visible in searches. You can follow us on Twitter, at Mage the Podcast. We're also on the web, magethepodcast.com. You can listen to past episodes there and see complete show notes. This episode is thanks to executive producers Ira Grace, Richard Bat Brewster, and Michael Parker. If you would like to Become an executive producer for Mage the Podcast. It would help us keep producing episodes. You would also become a part of our own council to discuss upcoming projects. The link in the show notes will get you started. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. And until next time, truth until paradox, baby. Tune in next time as we talk about World of Darkness Sorcerer. And after that, Isle of the Mighty and the Technomancer's Toy Box. And with that, bye.